What's poppin' everybody? Hello and welcome to Popcorn Culture. My name is Ben Carlin and I am your host. Here with me today is my brother Jay. Wow, wow. Not even saying who's in every episode now. I know, I know. You get to say Ben Carlin, I, you're just like I'm my brother Jay. So, for, just let me introduce myself, y'all, here in episode 10. I am Jonathan Carlin. Wow, you Mostly all, known as Jay. All eight letters. Yeah. I prefer to think of you as a single letter. Yeah, well that's how, I mean, that's the thing. We only spell... I only spell, if you call me J, it is just the letter J. It is not J-A-Y. No, you can tell that. I, th- there's yeah. a difference. Like, like your name is J. Right. And then, like, like we have a friend from college name who is named J. Right. You know, that's that's like J-A-Y. Right, yeah. yeah that was you, my roommate in college was right, J. Right, yeah. But I'm just J. No, I'm hearing the difference 100%. Yeah. No no, no further explanation needed. <clears throat> yeah. I, I think everyone at home is like, why are you even explaining this? It's so obvious. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. They're Everybody's like, like just it, y'all are being wow. It's like explaining the difference between there and there. You know, everyone just knows. Everyone just knows. Yeah. That okay, the there and there argument like people who get frustrated when other people use there and there wrong. Like to me at this point in time, it has become so obvious because everybody is frustrated with the exact same grammar problem that anyone who gets it wrong is like like accidentally did it. I don't think that people are unknowingly uh using their and there, and there. I think that, you hear that last one was T-H-E-Y, apostrophe R-E. I could tell. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. No, no, I got it. <laughs> I'm with you. Um, but no, this is this is like one of those things where, where once upon a time, I remember having the difficulty with it because I was like, oh, which one do you use? And then um, somewhere along the way, I you know I, I learned it through AOL Instant Messenger or something, and I, I actually started getting like my grammar correct. But then once you start getting it correct and you see someone get it wrong, it does feel like this weird, uh, I, I don't even know what it is. It's like, it's like, how could you mess that up? Here's the the only way I ever remember it is if you're talking about here or there, then you just spell out the word here in there, like T H E R E. That's here or there. Here or there. And then if it's they all, if it's not that, and it's also not they are, then it's the other one. Then and it's, it's T H E I R. Okay. Okay. Wait. No, I thought T H E I R is is like possessive. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, okay. That's the only one left. That's the only one left. <laughs> That's the only one left. <laughs> the, I couldn't no. describe to you the usage. It's just process of elimination. <laughs> just like I'm not talking about something over there, and it's not they are, so it's E I R. There it mm-hmm, is. Like, you get mm-hmm. it right every time. Although th- to be, I totally agree with your point that if and when I inevitably just make this mistake because I'm laying in bed sending a tweet using the word there and someone corrects me, I'm just like, just, just stop. (laughs) Just, it's, you know, did that stop you from understanding what I meant? The answer is no. The language was communicated effectively. If you are reading it and getting so caught off guard, like, well, now, now wait a minute though. He means they are, but he didn't write that. So I don't understand this anymore. And she's like, yeah, right? Cause that's not your experience. You know what it is. It's just like ticking some annoying like cog in your brain that you need to just like, you've, you've inserted that cog there and you need to take that cog out and just let it ride. No, and that, that's exactly my point though. That's, that is that is precisely what I'm saying is that I, I think that this is almost like a triggering thing for people where yeah. where like, yeah, like it, it has become, it has reached a point where uh, en- enough people know it to where like in those circumstances where somebody messes it up, it, it has become like almost as like blown out of proportion thing. Mm-hmm. But like, so everything you just said, you started by saying like, just just like, you know what I mean? To me, literally when I when someone corrects me, I, I just say the words, just, just like, like, and then I trail off, you know, it's like, just, that's this is it. this is this is our, our dad used to say to us hear what I mean son yes that yeah. is exactly what he said just hear what I mean hear what I mean and it was uh it was one of these things where if we were these uh, we were not bad about it but like if we were being a bratty know-it-all kid and he asked us to do something it was like well technically yeah yeah uh it's like he, he would basically just be saying the version of like you kn- you know what I'm asking you to do right yeah hear what I mean hear right. what I mean I think I gave our dad a real southern accent just now <laughs> which he does not have <laughs> yeah not even at all he is from the north and and is a, a TV news anchor, therefore has like just a very neutral voice. Right, very non-regional diction. Do you know? think that we? And this is a question for the for the the colonels at home as well. Do you do you think that we have like a southern like undertone to our voice a little oh, bit? Oh, I think we must. But I think compared to many people who live in our neck of the wood, that we do not. There's just the one tree. For there's in case people are wondering why I said the neck of the wood, the neck of the tree. <laughs> there's there's one tree nearby. <laughs> Every once in a while, if you're lucky enough, you can get one of the golden apples that grows on it. 
I know, so it's tasty. A, it's amazing. So yeah. tasty. Um, I That would be an interesting question to hear because uh, my assumption is that people who live more south of us think we don't and people who live at all north of us think we do. Sure. And people who live west of us think we do. Okay, so the big thing that I know that I say all the time that that I think is considered southernish is saying the word y'all. No, y'all is a fantastic solution to to, all. to the uh what is it uh, uh second person plural right is second that, yes, yeah, yes yeah yeah that it is a fantastic solution because nobody says you all or you guys or you guyses or whatever like that all sounds stupid and not only that because the alternate is you guys right you guys. And, there's already a sentiment against just the word guys for plural groups of people. Yes, of because, course. Because like, I think I've described it or heard it described before that like a stadium full of 79,000 women and like one man is guys. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. So, sure. and it should not be. And uh, that that's stupid. So guys, uh, y'all is just better because yeah. it's gender neutral. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. No. And so I love it. I love it. I'm, I would be a huge advocate for the word y'all. Um, the other thing that I, that I have gotten before is mixed reactions to like, so I, I feel like we were, we were brought up saying like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Uh, yes or no, sir. Oh uh, yeah. And one thing in particular that I think gets people is uh, like, and I will say this to, to everybody mm -hmm. like all the time. And if I say yes, ma'am to someone very, very, very frequently. Uh, I think it comes off as if I am suggesting that this person is much older. <laughs> no, I the, yes, and there's such a terrific irony in that because from their point of view, you're being very impolite when what you're doing is what was part of like politeness training as it, a child. Right. It's like I took a class on how to be polite, and this was like it, one of the things in the class. Right. Like I'm, I'm not I'm not attempting. So yeah, that's that's another question to throw out there to people is if you are referred to as ma'am or sir, does it make you feel old? Ooh, hmm. Tim, this, ooh, this is an interesting one. I'm just thinking about it, just thinking out loud here. Don't have any basis for this. Uh, but to me, I would bet that ma'am makes people feel older in a way that sir does not. Like, oh. and this is, this is, it, it, and I could be totally wrong. It feels like the kind of thing where like ma'am indicates older woman, whereas sir indicates some sort of like, distinguished man oh, or something. Oh, like, like, be, like because of where the where and when these words would have been sourced, mm -hmm. that is more likely what the original versions of it would have been going back to saying May them from I, the beginning. Maybe maybe not. Maybe just maybe that's how it's evolved. I don't think that's where it started. Okay, okay. Interesting. But this is, mm, it's interesting how, because you wouldn't, you'd think politeness would be like pretty universal through generations, but it's interesting that like the things you learned, like to say, yes, ma'am, which would have just been considered gen, like general General polite, generally accepted politeness when we were a kid, right, would now come across as potentially impolite and insensitive as an adult, right? Which is strange. Which is strange. Mm. Or do you think? Okay, interesting. Interesting thought. Do you think if you say as an adult, yes, ma'am, to someone, it's less acceptable than if, say, a six-year-old boy said yes, ma'am, or something? Oh, interesting. Okay, so like, like almost even allowing the age disparity to exist in the way that it needs to for this hierarchical, uh... I don't even know if that's a word. Right. Uh, but like, but like, you know, if, um, if, if like a, you're trick or treating and you're age six and you know, you show up to your wife, Beth's house or you yeah. your wife house. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Show your up to house. my house and yeah. my wife who is 31 hands you a piece of candy. And that's in that five, six year old kid says, thank you, ma'am. Right. Like, is it much more acceptable because the distance between the six year old and the 31 year old, it's like 25 years versus if I am at Starbucks as a 30 year old man and there is a 27 year old barista and I say thank you ma'am right like it's almost is, is that what you're saying I like think, yeah like is it I, my feeling is that if a kid says it you you know they have just been taught how to be polite and they're just sort of parroting that from right. their yes, parents yes, and of you course. just like appreciate what a polite kid right like, like it, they're doing the things right it's even closer to when you would have learned like when you would have gone through politeness training right exactly yeah. whereas as an adult the perception on the receiving end must be like they just that like you you have decided it's not, it's no longer just a matter of like this is just reactionary politeness this is determined a, a politeness via determination Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. you have you have determined them to be ma'am and therefore old. Okay, so the thing that on this note that I that I do have absolutely no idea why I like wh why there are like mental walls in my head about it is specifically like with Alice and the determination to call her um like where it would have previously been the girl that I'm dating mm -hmm. to now the sentiment or, or that I never would have said the woman that I'm dating. Oh. I would always say the girl that I'm dating is Alice, not the woman that I'm dating is Alice. Interesting. Um, and, and I have absolutely no idea when or how or where in the process I, I would start to differentiate which word I was selecting to describe, you know, like like if, if I'm at the grocery store and I'm in the parking lot and I'm pulling out of my parking spot and somebody like, you know, pulls their buggy out behind me or something like that. It'd be like, oh, this woman like pulled out behind me. Um, um, for some reason, I reach for it under that circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I, I don't know why or have you like if you if you're referring to Beth as someone, do you say like, I, I guess I don't even know how to feel. It feels awkward. <laughs> OK, I'm going to just flip the tables here. OK. And be like, have you ever do you think Alice would have described you as the man she was dating? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're not a not. man. <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> I, I am a hundred percent sure that she would have said the guy I'm dating. Right, the guy. I, I would I would be willing to bet uh thirty-seven dollars and sixty-three cents that at no point in time has she ever referred to me as like the man she's dating. Right. Or the man she's married to. Right. I think I think we have all brought that up, like with our generation as like man and woman, I feel like are phrases that describe older people. I think so. You know? Yeah. <laughs> More, like almost and maybe that's how people are reacting when I say ma'am to them. Yeah, that's is, might is be, like yeah. they think I think that's what I'm saying. Um, but that, that being said, it's not as though, like, you do a bunch of, like, um, typically manly things. Me? Like, yeah. Like, I you do, do manly tons things. of, like, yard work and, you know, you can install the plumbing and stuff. Like, sure. you've, got, you've got a vast variety of tools and things like that. I'm honored. I'm yeah. honored. <laughs> I think. You think? <laughs> I don't even know. Is this a compliment or an observation? But there's, okay, there's a weird thing that goes, there, like, be like, like, man is such a, there's certain connotations with that in so many different, like, like, if you're like a real, like, manly man, that feels like someone who's, like, lives in the wood and chops wood and, A chops wood know, is always what is, comes to my know, mind, it's yeah. Like, it's like hunting and. Like, like the type of person. He's like grizzly. The type of person who actually not only owns an ax, but sharpens it. Mm. Like, on a, on, on like a regular case. And shaves like, with it. They have like a. <laughs> They have like a well-maintained axe. Okay, so this is so like you say like I, I like do like uh, quote unquote manly type things. Uh, one somewhere along the way, uh, one of my friends was renting a house that was like a hundred hundred acres of uh, land, mm -hmm. and it, to me, I was like, oh my god, this is gonna be so much fun. We're gonna get to have like all these woodland adventures. Yeah. And so somewhere along that way, I went and bought like my first chainsaw. Yeah. And so one of the things, I and, and this is like I, I do think that I felt pretty cool going in. I yeah, bought, I bought a steel. That's S T I H L oh. steel chainsaw, which is a, which is a good one. <laughs> <laughs> which which to the uh, to the non educated man probably just sounds like a really heavy chainsaw. Uh, it's a made <laughs> it's of a steel. steel. No. <laughs> 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 it is so hard to move. Very <laughs> ineffective. Um, the 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 speed at which I realized I drastically knew nothing about chainsaws mm -hmm. happened like within 36 hours of purchasing it. Okay. Um, because so basically they they lived in this house and it was uh, the the only source of heat was like a wood burning stove. And so because it was 100 acres of woods, we were able to go out and find a dead tree and like take it down so that we could chop it up and uh, turn it into firewood. Mm -hmm. And uh, upon getting out there in my mind I, it's like sure you walk up you take the chainsaw to the side of the tree okay. and it, it falls, falls over, over. <laughs> Not so. Not how it works. There is there is a whole process in, into the way in which you have to like notch the tree and then cut it from the opposite side so that it falls like in the direction of the notch. Yeah. And um, that is like a whole thing. Yeah. So I'm standing out there with my shiny new chainsaw and and Made neither of steel. neither of us <laughs> huh Made, Made of steel. steel. <laughs> neither of us has any idea what we're doing. It is a dead tree. Just for full clarification, it is like there are no branches on it. It's just a really tall log that's roots are still in the ground. Um, um, and so we're, we're attempting to notch it. So like, you know, we, we cut like a little pie crust piece out of one side and we're going through. And then because of the way the tree is leaning, it just pinches onto my chainsaw. Uh, so it is like stuck, <laughs> like not going anywhere pinned into this. Like, I mean, I don't even know how heavy it 
probably the whole entire like log was like 1200 pounds. My God, do you know what I think it's really easy to underestimate is the weight of a tree. Yeah. It looks like just a real tall stick <laughs> and you can pick up sticks, no problem. I do it, I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, is a tree not just a real long stick. Un <laughs> Until you're actually going to, especially in this capacity, like interacting with the tree. The other thing is it is in immensely dangerous, like cutting down a tree. Because if it falls on mm. you, like it is like you are going to be seriously hurt, if not killed. If like, not killed. Not to mention you're you're also coming at it with uh, I want, a, a steel chainsaw. Yeah, you also with, have, yeah, weaponized uh, or mechanized weaponry yes. to an extent with you. Um, yeah, I think. I don't know, but I think lumberjacking has a like one of the least attractive death rates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is not entirely surprising. Although if you want some really good Instagrams to follow, I, I wish I had a good name right offhand, but watching lumberjack Instagrammers is crazy because the guys who like literally climb up the tree and then mm. cut off like a tree sized piece of a huge tree right. from the top. And like, they're literally up there and they've got like, a GoPro on and they're like using the chainsaw from like, you know, your chest to the tree lit width apart and like right. you know, they, they can fell them perfectly. It's amazing. Um, anyway, so in our particular instance though, we are, um, we're out there and, and we knew enough to buy this like wedge, okay. which is basically like a hard piece of plastic that in the event that this very thing happens, you can like hammer the wedge into the tree to get the tilt to go the other way. Mm. Um, so we actually had multiple of them and we had a sledgehammer. And so we hammered like five of these wedges into it, trying to get my chainsaw out, which was not working. Finally, Steven, um, my, my friend basically was able to just like get like one hit, the whole thing went and chainsaw fell out and the tree went down and we started, you know, cutting it up to bring it down to cut it for wood. So the next thing I very quickly figure out is that sharpening a chainsaw is like brushing your teeth. Like it's not the type of thing that you do like, like, like w once. Oh you know, and, and then you're good. Right. It's like, you have to do it all the time. I see. And that's, and so I'm sitting there with my brand new chainsaw and it's taking me like 30 minutes to cut through this log oh, because gosh. it is so dull so quickly from where I basically had the one, you know, right off the shelf that probably wasn't, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe it was supposed to be sharp. Maybe I just ruined it by not knowing what I was doing. All of the above seem like likely situations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so as much as I think that I felt like a cool guy, manly dude, the day, the moment I was buying my chainsaw, it immediately was like, I know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> There is, it's, it's, yeah, that's funny that so often you can be humbled by what you uh, assume to be a simple task. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I also think it's interesting that the, like, how many different meanings the word, like, manly, I feel like can kind of take on. Sure. Because you could be, like, some, like, gruff woodsman, but I feel like you would probably call most, like, you know, typical biker guys, like, real manly, and that's, like, a, it's, like, within the same genre. But then you would also, I think, you know, if you were, like, a high-powered, like, lawyer or politician or something like there's a certain amount of like manliness about that like that's a kind of man sure you sure, know sure or i think like even just there there's a certain manliness to like parenthood or you know husband oh stuff you know th there is no two ways about it there, yeah. i think that that is one of those things that even watching you become a dad mm -hmm. has been one of the most eye-opening experiences ever watching like your parenting and i'm like I'm, I'm like constantly impressed oh thank with, you <laughs> yeah of course uh because i'm like man this is like my brother who I've known my whole life who is now like doing things that like I, that not that I never would have imagined you doing because I always assumed you would be a, a dad um but like watching them come out like why like watching you you know like tend to Luke or change a diaper or you know like handle the screaming baby like all these things it's like the the caregiver element of you absolutely does fall I think into this same exact category mm -hmm. which is I would argue not the stereotype but may as well should be because it's awesome well said brother thank you thank well you. said thank you well said okay then we have to uh we have to touch on some stuff here some some stuff from some other episodes okay yeah yeah so, let's do it so first of all first of all uh as we record this it is february 10th which means that this week by the time people hear this it will have already been isan van pavia day isan van pavia day is february it? friendsgiving hold on does this episode come out on the it does oh happy isan van pavia day oh my gosh everybody all the the kernels of the world little kernels happy isan van east van oh no i've had it so well isan what? van pavia day isan van pavia day yeah that yeah 
Yeah. February Friendsgiving. Yeah, in case anybody needs a quick refresher, uh, what you should be doing with your day today is getting together with all of those friends who you who you choose to mm-hmm. include in your life because this is our problem. As much as I love seeing family and as much as you need a good reason to see them, mm-hmm. I feel like on Thanksgiving, it's this strange thing where you go and you spend your entire holiday with 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 like not the people who you regularly choose to occupy, you know, to, to spend your time with. Right. We need a day for that. Need and we didn't need Valentine's Day. We didn't need Valentine's Day. It's gone. It's gone. And we say that not as like single people who are jaded, but as married people who are still kind of like, what? I don't, whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which I will say is not just, I don't think me and Ben's opinion, <laughs> well, I can't speak for Alice, but Beth is often just like, uh, whatever. She d- She's not like a big Valentine's Day girl. Okay. So I, I asked Alice about Woman. this. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> Way to get yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ma'am. <laughs> now now I'm going to hear it from Beth. You're like, don't call me woman. <laughs> It's so true. Oh goodness. Um, so I asked I asked Alice about this over the weekend. We were driving around, and I I was telling her about this new holiday that we've invented, which she thought was genius. Um, and so I was like, like, well, like, what's your take on it? Because she she owns, and we've talked about it before, like a bridal shop, and she has flowers. So this week uh, is like a huge week for someone who owns a flower shop because there are tons and tons and tons of orders that come in for mm-hmm. obviously you know roses and stuff to be delivered yeah, on Valentine's I need to Day. Order. It's pr- we know someone yeah, fortunately yeah and so my question for her though because we've, we've never we have had very intermittent um valentine's days like where a couple of them we've done nothing i think there was like one year where i gave her like like one of each of the classic things like you know a, a stuffed creature a box of chocolates and dozen uh, roses and and flowers or yeah. something yeah so i sort of did like all the all the normal things and then like last year i think for the girls we gave is like when we told them we were taking another trip to disney so that was like a weird excuse to to go all out on it. Right. Um, but that obviously would, would sort of be like an anomaly over the, the wavelength of how we normally handle it. And so I was asking her because I actually didn't know the answer to it. Like, do, do you like celebrating Valentine's Day or is it something that you can be, you know, excited about or do you like, I don't know, whatever. Because you spend your whole day delivering flowers to like half the people in our area. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think she did not want to admit this to herself at all. But I do think that she was like, I do kind of like oh, really? doing something. Okay. Doing something. All so, right. So I, I was like, okay, I need to, I need to have a plan. So as of you guys hearing this, hopefully I figured that plan out because as hopefully of present, I do not know. Well, well, the other thing you need to be planning out, Ben, is where are you going to be getting your French fries from? My French fries. I yeah, know. Because I know. the other half of Easton Mapavi Day, February Friendsgiving, is that everyone has to come over and bring their favorite French fries. AKA Friends fries. Friends fries. Exactly. Yes. So yes. I think we described it earlier as you have to cook as many oven trays as you have worth of French fries. You I have am, any idea how many oven trays I have? I know you have a lot. I I've, I have been baking pretty hard lately, yeah. so I have quite the collection. Okay. See, this is why this is why we we started drafting. We went through a few rounds of, of February Friendsgiving. Right. And I think the better way to do it is to obviously you have to include all your friends in the in the in the giving part, and what they're what you're all giving each other is the fries from your favorite fry establishment. Fry establishment. Fry establishment. Great word. Great word. Yeah. But so, where do you have a place that you think serves the best French fries? Ooh. French okay. fries. So probably my favorite friend fries in Roanoke, Virginia right now mm-hmm. is at a place called Martin's, and they have twisted steak fries, which are like steak fries, but twisted. Mm, and they're, they're delicious. They are good. That, and so I would say I would say that I think those are up there. Uh, second place, in case you're visiting Roanoke, Virginia, and you're looking for a good place to go, uh, Wall Street Tavern also has these like Parmesan Ooh. something fries. Mm-hmm. And they're they're mega super deep fries. So they've got like a, a nice like crackly, crusty, bubbly uh, exterior that, right. that has like a nice like crunch bite to it, you know? Crunch bite. Yeah, like you need like a good fry, I feel like has like a good crunchy exterior but then like the interior is still soft Mm -hmm. like you don't want the whole thing to be crunchy or soft or soft definitely not all soft (laughs) not all mush like like an undercooked uh what is it called a a fry that has ridges um it's kind of like a frozen frozen food aisle french fry do you know what i'm talking about like a like a ruffle fry maybe like a that's the wrong word i feel like a ruffle fry i don't know what a a wavy cut fry a wavy cut fry Yeah. yeah an undercooked wavy cut fry is my least favorite it's like it's like it was a frozen 
frozen fry and this is the one that had all the freezer burn on it so all the other fries are nice and crispy and great but this one just got soggy because it had too much ice on it it is the hot pockets of french fries mm, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It, i know what you're talking about yeah thank you thank you yeah thank you for understanding where 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 were we headed with this we we're just trying to figure out where has the best french fries and where are your favorite french fries my oh boy okay so at like, I think I'm gonna, I'll, I will. I too shall list two places. Uh, here, here in the in the Roanoke, uh, I would. Oh man, I want to say there's some really good fries at this place called Beamers. Oh, Beamers. Yeah, have they fries. have really good fries. They have really good fries. Describe the fries for the folks at home. Well, they're, they're you can get like these garlic fr- garlic parmesan fries and. I don't know if I could say much more. They're like, they are, they're not wavy crot. They're, I think, do they have the skin on them still? Like on, they look like hand cut fries. Hand cut fries. I think that they're truffle oil. Truffle oil, Parmesan garlic fries. What is a truffle oil? Is that an oil that is, that is uh, surmised from a mushroom? Well, truffles I think are a kind of mushroom. So they must be pressing them to get the oil out. Goodness me. Well, I am looking up at kitchenswagger.com. Yeah. Baked Parmesan truffle fries recipe. And if if I could make anything that even looks remotely like this picture, then it would be what I would bring to Friendsgiving. To Friendsgiving. Friend, friend, Isan van Pavia Day. Yeah. So I think I think it's important to note if you're planning your own Isan van Pavia Day, February Friendsgiving, is that, it you know, if you want to make your own fries, highly encouraged. Go for it. However, don't feel like that is like excluding you. If you want to, I think part of it, you just go to your favorite fry joint just get a big old order show up it could be mcdonald's fries you know what i think there's nothing wrong with that in fact what i would really like to see is if you went through a drive through and just said just put as many fries as you can in a bag yes. and i'll meet you at that window oh like i want to see what people would get mm, okay like, i have a new answer okay okay this is maybe my more fries you can get around the country answer. okay around the around the uh, around, around the, the country in case you don't live in roanoke virginia chances are they don't yeah chances are you don't Some of you will, certainly. Thanks, Mom. (laughs) Oh, man. Um, Five Guys. Ooh, Five Guys. Five Guys fries. I feel like Five Guys has what I would define as like a purist fry. It is like, like I think they literally have bags of potatoes about when you walk in. And I think that they have a, a fry press, which is kind of like a grid thing that you put the tater in Mm -hmm. and then it's kind of like a a can crusher do you remember a can crusher from when we were kids dude a can crusher is one of the best things you can own and we owned one as kids and i have i'd have never brought up can crusher with anyone who also knew what it was really no one goodness me i loved our can crusher dude me too well i and what the funniest thing about this is i have actually like i've dropped this in conversation with friends before mm-hmm. and it's like it costs like 14 dollars, and for some reason i won't buy my own yeah i don't understand i need i need i need a can crusher is, we, what, is what it comes down to. I think part of the fun of it when we were kids, if you don't know what a can crusher is, this was like a thing mounted to the wall. Yeah. And basically when you finish drinking an, something out of an aluminum can, like a Sprite or a Coca-Cola, or at our house, probably a Diet Coke. That's what at our was. house growing up, not at my house now, but our mom loves Diet Coke. If you ever want to send her some, we have a P.O. box. We'll go to tour. <laughs> um, big on the Diet Coke. But so anyway, we had one bin in particular that was solely for aluminum cans to go in. Yes, because at, we had a really cool recycling place. Yeah. Yeah. Where they would just I guess you just go weigh it and they would just pay you for it or something. That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. So it was it was and I think that's how dad motivated us to do it. I mean, you'd be talking about like, you know, 12 can crushed can bags and we would get like, you know, $11 split Is three that ways. Right? I think so. <laughs> that's not much. The yield was minimal. The yield was minimal. But the point of the can crusher is to be able to fit more cans into the bin. Which we did. Which we did. But in the meantime, until you take them to the place to get your $11. <laughs> I want to say you'd be in tie would come up with it's like having a whole giant trash can full of sharp metal objects to play with <laughs> for kids for kids sticky sharp metal objects. <laughs> but but man would we? we we did i think we would like for, this must have been so annoying to our parents we would dump them out all the time because <laughs> they'd like i think we had like a hockey stick and we would use it as like a like you'd like shoot the cans into the back into the trash can that is a fact or else like you know 
uh, like beer pong them back in, like as if it was a giant basketball hoop. Right, right. Yeah. We did, yep. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have not. These memories are so f- like far hidden away in yeah. my in my brain desk that it's amazing to to relive them. Well, there you go. I'm glad I'm <clears throat> unlocking really old memory orbs from deep and long term memory. I'm imagining the little jelly beans in your brain from inside out are like, where are we going? <laughs> He has not been here <laughs> quadruple Z in, in years. Hey, oh man, we were ready to delete them. We were ready to delete them. Yes, like yeah, uh, <laughs> it's a long trip for them. It is a long it trip is. for those little jelly beans. But yeah, so if you too want your kids to have a giant just bin of sharp, sticky, crushed cans, this can- is this is a can crusher is for you. But in the meantime, it's so satisfying because all you do, you just put your can in there and you pull a lever and it is like crushed down so tiny, so tiny. Okay. So tiny. Do you remember there was one thing in particular about our home can crusher that drove me nuts? And I want to know if you know what it is without me explaining it. Um, was it that it was like at foot level? <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's part of it. Because dad totally installed this with us in mind. I'm 100% sure that he did not intend to crush the cans. No. Because he literally installed it at the height of someone's shin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to bend over, <laughs> right? Like to do this. There was plenty of wall in that room where it could have gone, and that's where he chose to put it. The other thing was we had baseboard heat, yeah. and so the handle would come down. No. And, <laughs> <laughs> Your fist would hit the, the heater. <laughs> it would hit the heater, and it was like it was so like like you almost felt like you could have crushed the cans a little bit more, mm-hmm. except the handle ran into the baseboard heat. Yeah, and so that was just annoying and. And we dealt with it, I guess, because it never really slowed us down. We did it all the time. All the time. I, we had, like, a babysitter who would come over and, like, drink a beverage solely so she could use the can crusher. Yeah, that so, was a thing. So... Let me just tell you guys, if you're sitting there like, why would anyone want a can crusher? What is the point? Let me just tell you, if you need, if you're like, man, can I, can I drink, can I consume more beverages? It will motivate you and your kids to just plow through any canned drink you have in the house because the joy of crushing a can with a can crusher. Plus recycling. Recy- yeah. Yeah, recycling. Okay, we'll we'll put a link to a can crusher as an afterthought in the show notes, um, so that so that everybody can go and get their own can crusher. Mm-hmm. And you you can and should and must tweet us a photo of your first crushed can. Yes, because I'm 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 so excited to to see what people what people do. I want to know how many people do it. I I'm. Okay. I'm very excited to see pictures of that and of your Island Van Pavia Friendsgiving gatherings. Yes, yeah. that too. I want to see that. No, okay, before we move on, let okay. me just say, back to Five Guys. Yeah, And yeah. their wonderful french fries and barrels full of peanuts. Um, one of the things, whenever, whenever people start talking about, like, best fast food burgers, there's always this East Coast, West Coast battle. Do you know the two restaurants upon which I am discussing? I feel like the West Coast is In-N-Out Burger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And the East Coast, which is the Beast Coast, yeah. is, oh, um... It's Shake Shack. Shake Shack. That yes. is exactly what it is. We don't have one near us. We don't have one near us. We have a steak and shake. We have so, which, which is, is not so, the same It's just thing. not the same. I Man, my, my wife, Beth, it would frustrate her to no end that I could not remember the difference between Shake Shack and Steak and Shake, to which I'm like, are you kidding? They, <laughs> they Not only do they, birth, do they both serve milkshakes and hamburgers, but they have the word shake in their name. Right. Like, it's so easy. I've already I've already forgotten which one is which. What do we have? We we have steak and shake. Steak and shake. We have steak which and shake. Which is not good. Which is <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it, okay, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Said the we little don't, dog in the burning house. We don't it's fine. We don't have Shake Shack, which is the <clears throat> East Coast's answer to in and out Burger on the West Coast, which has no available rhyme to compete with the East Coast, which is the Beast Coast. Um, but let me tell you, people argue themselves hoarse about whether or not they like in and out Burger or Shake Shack, and let me just tell everyone, let me definitively answer this argument for uh-oh, you. Uh-oh, here it comes. The answer Strong opinions about things that don't matter, go ahead. Is that Five Guys is better than both of them by a mile. A full 5,280 one... feet. Yes, exactly. Wow! Yeah, it's not even close. Why are people even discussing if you're, if, oh, I don't understand. You're, I, I can tell you're worked up. Five Guys exists up. on both coasts and it's way better. Yes. No, yeah. I, I, I do. We have had both. Okay. So I remember, um, with, with having our, our strange YouTube careers, um, 
We have made more trips to L.A. than I ever expected to make in my life. Mm. And as a result, inevitably, there was the, should we should we go to In-N-Out Burger? And yeah. I was like, I've heard such good things. Let's do it. And I, <sighs> I, I, don't, I certainly don't want to, like, tell anybody, like, I, I don't quite get it. I think is literally what my my reaction to this is like it is um perfectly adequate perfectly adequate yeah. is, is a fine way to put it but like I, I don't think even minus going into it with high expectations I would have walked out of there and been like dude what an underrated burger yeah um, and how are you supposed to get it? Like all the way? Animal style. Animal style. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I have I have done every variation of it and I, I largely feel like it's an okay-ish burger. On the other hand, we were in New York City, yep. which is when we went to Steak Shack. <laughs> Shake Shack. Shack. So you're also messing it up. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. Shake Shack. <laughs> Shake Shack. Um, to which... My main issue is that actually in town, there is a, a burger joint called Jack Brown's, which I think has the exact same burger that is better here. Um, and so while I actually think that out of those two, I would prefer the East Coast, which I'm not even gonna try again. <laughs> Shake Shack? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Um, so Shake Shack, I think, is better than In-N-Out Burger, which I think both of which are worse than Jack Brown's, which I think is on par with Five Guys, which is available everywhere. There you go. So the answer is everyone needs to stop their belly aching about Shake Shack versus In-N-Out Burger and just go to Five Guys and you'll just be happier. You'll just, you'll just, be, you'll just be, be happier. A happier soul. The next time this comes up, and it will, you can just own the conversation and be like, Five guys. Done. Out. Done. Mic drop. And then everybody will, will have way more time on their hand to go and enjoy their meal. They will. They will. Yeah. No doubt. Okay. Okay. Anyway, we've been, and to, to be, we have been to the Shake Shack in New York City where the whole chain started. Oh, we have been to the the one. The, well, I don't know if it, I think it, it it grew from a specific restaurant, but we've been to the one in New York City. Okay. The the, the chain started in New York City. I don't know if it's the 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 the, the, the one. Right. It's the one near Broadway. Yes. We've been there. Do you remember while we were there, we we met a nice family who found out that we were YouTubers, had no idea who we were, but thought it was so cool they wanted to take a picture with us anyway. I do remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I thought that was the most. That was like the oddest exchange ever. It's like, oh, you're important. Let's take a picture. We could have been lying. We could have been lying. Could have. We weren't. On that note, okay, we're also this, not important. This though. is this is this is a very unnecessary tangent, but I do think it's one of the funniest things ever. One of the first ever meet and greets we did was at a conference, maybe VidCon, somewhere along the way. A, <coughs> I don't know what story you're going to tell, so I can't confirm which one you're going to talk okay, about. <laughs> okay, so we were we were in a group uh, where we were actually put in like last minute. This is playlist. Playlist live. Yeah. Okay. In Orlando. Um, in Orlando. And uh, so we were in a group with a whole bunch of like prankster YouTubers and, yeah. and then it was us. And so- But we didn't know that. We did not know until that. Until we showed up. Like the guy who hooked it up for us was like, you guys want to meet and greet? And we're like, absolutely. And we show up and it's real obvious what has happened. Someone dropped out. Yeah, someone dropped out of the prankster meet and greet. And he was like, I got guys who can fill you. Right. So with the idea here being that Roughly, roughly speaking, maybe if you like this particular prankster YouTuber, chances are you're also familiar with these other four people right. who also do prankster videos and then us. And so during that, we actually ended up having plenty of people that came through who knew us and it was fantastic and they were all amazing. But at the very, very, very least, there was one person who came through and it's so funny in situations like this because I think the the people coming through the line meeting the, you know, the quote unquote celebrity, the talent, uh, is just as aware as, of, of the circumstances as we are are mm -hmm. and they were like i'll take a picture with you like almost as if like they were doing it to like make us not feel awkward like, right like like they were like don't worry i got you like like i'll 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 make this okay i'll take a picture with you <laughs> like make you feel important don't give me that pity pic <laughs> Well, it worked out because there was one girl who we met and we took a picture with who had no idea who we were. And then like two years later, I remember she she tagged us in the photo and she was like, oh my gosh, I became a huge fan of this YouTube channel called the Super Carlin Brothers and I wanted to meet them for so long. And uh, I was digging through my photo the, or my phone the other day and it turns out I already have. That's hilarious. And I, yeah. It I was it, that girl. It was that girl. Oh yeah, man, yeah, yeah. that's so, so funny. So we had met, we had met someone 
they came through, had take a pity picture with us, and um, ultimately just like not even related to that event, right? Became fans of the channel and then realized that they had already met us, which I thought for forever that has been like I, I can't. I wish I even knew the person's name, but it's like one of the more hilarious interactions we've had with anybody. I was so nervous when we did that meet and greet that that's how because of how we got in all the prankster things. So yeah, the way the way a lot of these meet and greets at cons work is you'll have you'll meet like a group of creators at once so you sign up like w with which group you want to meet right so you're gonna meet like five people or five channels or whatever uh-huh and so yeah it, um we we were we were like this fandom channel and then it was four prank channels right yeah so and gosh because the person the first person that the people were gonna meet was clearly of the of the other prank channels the big one the one that's the most one, well known yeah. he yeah. probably should have been at the end of the line yes yeah. yes i will say that if you're organizing a, a conference you want the most popular person to be at the end right so that everybody yeah. comes through everyone the comes whole thing. through yeah. yeah because what happened was that because he was easily the most popular person in that meet and greet the people who were really excited to he see him were the most excited like people there so like the first maybe 10 people in line were there they, like they were the biggest fans of the biggest person there and they got there early right and then didn't care about meeting anyone else so the first like 10 people come through and we're like god yeah it, yeah. it, it was it was <clears throat> definitely like a major major humbling moment where i was like i was like it was it was such an honor to be asked to do like a meet and greet like as if as if like other people in the industry had per perceived enough demand for us to be there that that like, <laughs> that like we had this thing and then it was like this is the exact opposite of how I thought this was going to go. Like, I, I I thought that this was going to be this, like, I don't know, feeling special moment. And instead, it was, for the first 15 minutes of it, I was, like, beat red. <laughs> Terrible. But eventually, <clears throat> those super fans cleared out. And then, I almost think, I want, I, my recollection is that our last minute inclusion in this particular meet and greet, like, really attracted a lot of people to it. That that otherwise were not fans of Prankster. The Prankster yeah, channels. Yes. Yeah, which that must have been awkward for all of them. I know, I know. So yeah. the, the, the tide, the tide mm -hmm. shifted a little bit at one there, point in time. Uh, I do remember this was the first time we ever did it like this like the meet and greet at all and I think I always remember there was like one little girl in there who she was there with her parents and they like told us they'd flown from Texas specifically so she could meet us and I was like there's no way that's true. Uh, that, that, <laughs> because yeah, you were mistaken. Yeah, right? yeah, you were, <laughs> we're uh, not the guys no. <laughs> well, we're not the droids you're looking for. Yeah, I don't <laughs> um, and that's so funny and, and interestingly even on the same the same token so we've done like a meetup series now like uh, like uh, across the country where we've been to like Chicago and Washington DC and Salt Lake City and a few different places where we like rent out a movie theater and people come and like yeah. watch the movies with us. Probably the people listening, I think are <clears throat> the ones aware of that, yeah. <laughs> that we do this. Uh, but hey. the very first one we ever did. Oh yeah. The, the funny thing about it was we had our friend Seamus Gorman, who is like a fellow um, Harry Potter uh, Pixar theorist on YouTube uh, was in town to come and do like a Spartan race with us and to sort of be like a part of the event. And and so we're like super nervous about the whole thing because it is the first one we've ever put on. Yeah. We have no idea what to expect. <laughs> we're like scrambling, like people who weren't even like signed up as volunteers ended up like working the whole event and yeah. not watching the movie and <laughs> being phenomenal. So the behind the scenes was just pure noise and mayhem. Um, and then, you know, of course this like first person walks up and the very first person who's ever come to a super Carlin brothers meet and greet is like, I'm actually just here to, meet Seamus yeah. and it was like it's what cool. has happened <laughs> like like I think the fear again it was it, I, I went straight back to that that first moment and I was like oh no <laughs> yeah I remember that moment and uh there was like a, oh boy I hope like this is gonna be awkward yeah yeah but not that not if you like Seamus more than us that's totally fine but oh yeah no of course perfectly acceptable yeah. that that, that I take no issue with too. Yeah. but in the in the event that you came to this specific event which was definitely set up and advertised as a super Carlin Brothers meetup um where we had like a space like a table you know that Seamus was like hanging out at yeah I think that you may have been uh it w may have not been what you were expecting yeah for yeah. that one kid. Anyway, the rest of the day went fine. Anyway, yeah, that. super yeah. good day. Super good day. All right, Ben. So I see we got a lot of feedback from people who, in fact, knew people who were on reality shows. Yes. Okay. I was very excited about this. The the strange thing about having any sized audience whatsoever is is like uh, being able to ask so many people a question that I I desperately want the answer to be yes to, mm -hmm. and 
people came through a little bit. Yeah. Like people, people knew people, which I thought was fascinating. And it was even interesting to me. Uh, a lot of the people who wrote back and specifically if they knew like a bachelor contestant, the way that they described someone who I absolutely know who they are is like, they would like give me like all this like additional background. Like they were the person who did this or whatever. It's like, oh, I know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> like I know, I know exactly who that is. Um, but it was, it was kind of fascinating because one person did actually know um, a villain from one season or at least what the show turned into uh, a villain. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I thought this one was, was kind of interesting because uh, when you sign up to do like a reality TV show, uh, one of the things that you do have to sign into is like, they can, they can present you in a negative light. Right. And that is something that like when you go on the show, I mean, they may not be targeting you specifically, but if they can build a narrative around you being the bad guy, they're going to do it. They're going to, there's going to be a bad guy. And, and you did agree to it. Um, right. And so uh, the one, one person wrote in um, that actually knew Luke P. Oh gosh. This, I mean, that's from the last season of The Bachelorette with Hannah Brown. Hannah Brown. Hannah Brown, who ABC just loves. <laughs> yes. They, they, <laughs> they, they put her on everything. Absolutely. Yeah. She like um, won Dancing with the Stars. She was The Bachelorette. And yeah. She has now made several appearances in the current season of The oh, Bachelorette. Yeah, the I'm not Bachelor. even 100% sure that she's not who he ends up with, even though she's not on this season. And, and I'm, <laughs> saying that like somewhat jokingly but also like kind of seriously but, like wouldn't be surprised if she shows up at after the final rose or whatever something yeah something, something I, like I don't that. think it's over but her season of the bachelorette may as well have just been about the villain luke p luke p okay so he he basically um you know he came on and and hannah really like seemed to like him in a way that all of the other guys just could not comprehend right and it's it's so hard to know what's going on behind closed doors and of course you know we only see what the camera shows us and they if they're if they're spinning a narrative then we're going to see that uh -huh. um uh but apparently this person said that uh they don't know them personally but they did know that being that they that their perception of them coming from their hometown was that they were like a super that luke was a super nice person mm -hmm. who went on to be on the show that was then spawned to be a villain so i don't know i thought that was just kind of interesting mm -hmm. in and of itself specifically to know someone who caught so much negative spotlight oh um, yeah now, moving on to uh, a note from Michaela. This one was kind of interesting just because I thought it was fun. But she said that um, her and her mom used to watch the show together. And uh, once upon a time, they were like watching it in their living room when all of a sudden on screen, their dad walked on. <laughs> That's surprising surprising um not it, dating the woman no 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 <laughs> um but he is a pilot and he was one of the pilots that was hired to fly the mm. um whoever the the main contestant was on a date and so apparently he kept the dad kept it a secret uh at least from his daughter until the episode aired so that right. like it could be like a fun surprise mm -hmm. which i was like that's so cool like especially you know if you know that like your your son or daughter or whatever family member loves a show and then getting this like be on it yeah and kind of have that like that's really cool that holy crap moment yeah of course i'm sure he had to sign a bazillion ndas and whatever i'm i'm sure that that's also true yeah. yeah yeah um the other things okay so i did some research a little bit about reality tv in general because i wanted to see what types of stories have like floated to the surface because the the nda thing that you talk about is such a big deal with all of this stuff we've yeah. even done projects before where we've signed ndas and it's like like it's super strict. Like we can't talk about anything to do with what we did. Yeah. And um, so it's interesting because in order for any of these stories to exist, it probably means that someone broke their NDA and that they were not supposed to tell the story. Yeah. They've probably leaked it or tried to leak it in a very anonymous way. Exactly. Right. So yeah. it's, it's kind of hard to ever like pair back to it. But the stories that I was seeing is that across the board in a variety of different shows, like House Hunters, for example, is the one that we even got several emails about it. But it sounds like almost nothing to do with House Hunters at all is real. Oh, like this is uh, this is such a thing about reality TV is that they produce such a narrative for the viewer that's interesting, but which doesn't really happen. And I guess with something like House Hunters, maybe it's not that surprising because like, the, you know, for the circumstances of the show to exist, basically the realtor has to find three different houses right. that are all on sale and within the price range and perfect fits for the couple 
and the couple has to argue about it and no one else has to be intervening and you know whatever like you basically need a perfect storm of something every single week exactly exactly mm -hmm. right and that's the thing and and i think having gone through the home buying experience myself and like you know putting an offer on my house and then finding out that immediately after i put my offer in there was like three other ones it's sort of like the fact that these people are going back and forth and negotiating over days it's like that is not how it goes i don't yeah. know a single person who's had an experience like that yeah i mean i'm sure some people have but it's yeah it, it's what what did you learn or so describe first of all the like how the show typically works and then what you learned to be false about it. Okay. So the way the show typically works is that you have a couple who has a budget and they're looking for homes and usually they're going to, they're going to walk us through them experiencing three different homes. Okay. And I think that in general, uh, what you're supposed to do is sort of have like the economy home, the home that's like the right budget and then like the reacher home that like you probably shouldn't buy, but like has like a cool feature or something right. like that. So there's, there's supposed to be like an obvious, like up, down, all around to each of the houses that like is shown. Mm -hmm. Now I think the, and then at the, and they pick, you know, usually option B, the one that makes the most sense. Right. Um, <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? And um, I think a huge portion of what I have seen about this is that in some instances, none of it went down at all and the people don't live there and they didn't move and the whole thing was just like entirely an illusion. Right. Like um, they had, like to the point where they basically had two actors and three completely not for sale homes and they just showed off three houses. Effectively like the home buying process okay. is, is, is it, roughly speaking in, in super general terms. Like, I do think that there are people, they're, they're like real people. They're not like actors right. on purpose, but effectively they are the talent, Okay. Uh, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, but so what a lot of people have said is that on that show in particular, people have already bought a house mm -hmm. and it is the house that they ultimately end up picking. Oh, okay. And that... Um, the rest of what you're watching is entirely built out narrative. Oh, so like and before the show is even filming, they've already got the house they want. They've already got the house they want. And and typically what, what one person in particular said is that they were shopping for a vacation home. And after purchasing the home, they were approached by one of these shows to go on it. So it's like, like they, like it wasn't even like, through the home buying process, like hmm. the TV show was involved. It was like they bought a vacation home. And then from there, it was supposed to be like backpedaled out into this. That's interesting. Right. Like they had already bought it. But then we had one more person and then I won't go on for too long with it. Uh, that gave me a story that they lived in Ontario. And um, I'm trying to find the specific, the specific story here. Um, uh... Okay, okay, okay. So this story it came from a girl named Cassidy, and it said that her and her dad were on House Hunters in Vancouver. And the reason they remember it is because they live in Ontario, and they live in Ontario, the, the people that were on the show. Okay. And despite doing the House Hunters thing and choosing a house in Vancouver, they still live in Ontario. Oh. And she said that this is the first time uh, that she realized just how staged the show actually was, uh. basically. Which, I, yeah, I, I guess I just find fascinating. Like, to me, it feels like it breaks the rules so badly of telling an interesting story and that the whole thing is like fabricated in a weird way, mm -hmm. which is strange, I think, because when watching any scripted show ever, that is exactly what you're watching. Right. It's, it it's, is, it's the deception. It's the deception. It's the idea that it is being delivered as quote unquote reality TV, which I think has also fallen into a strange category because I think most people are aware of how staged it is. Right. And yet you still fall for it. You right. St you still become engaged. Let me tell you, the show that this was ruined for me the most was a show called Storage Wars. Yes. Which I don't, is it still on? I don't even know. Sure. Yes. If you don't, yes. I'm going to wildly declare. For When we were watching it, it was basically on 24-7. It mm -hmm. was like super popular. But the point of Storage Wars is that you've got these four people who go around and they're all sort of at odds with each other, but all sort of like friendly at the same time. And they're in a way that you can understand almost like, like right. they exist in the same community. They're all the people who are like the legits, the legits, and they show up and they're always, they're always in the same places bidding on the same things. Right. So, but what they're bidding on is, um, abandoned storage lockers. Right. So someone, someone rented a locker somewhere, they put all their stuff in it and then they stopped making payments and so the company who owns the lockers claims it and is auctioning off the contents or whatever 
Storage Wars has your people come in, they, they open the locker, they can like look, they can't go inside or touch anything, they can just look from the outside and decide whether or not they want to bid on it. And the pull of the show is that they're buying basically a lottery's worth of junk. And maybe there's something of extreme value in there. So <clears throat> can they can they buy someone's abandoned objects and turn it into fortune, basically? Or, or profit, <clears throat> even. Profit, you know? I bought this storage locker for $500. I'm going to sell this cool item I found for $3,000. Right, you know? right. It's, it's the dream, basically. It's the dream. Yeah. And so it's super, it's like a really fun show to watch because what could they find? It could be literally anything. And and I think <sighs> I even get that. Like, you know, I, I think I can even, I can I can so imagine the circumstances where, you know, somebody has the storage unit, they put all the stuff in there. At one point in time, they were like rare baseball card collectors. So there's a there's a, a shoebox that has that in it. Right. You know, and there's somewhere. A, there's a rookie Mickey Mantle card in there. And oh my God, this is unbelievable. Right, right, right. I but never then, could have found this. Never could have found it. But then on top of that, you can totally understand how there would also be like an old beaten up couch and a lamp that has like yeah. fringe on it and stuff. So it's a really fun show to watch because they they always they always find something that they have to go get, get checked out by some appraiser somewhere and they always know someone who can appraise it at an old antique shop or an old sign shop or something. Which again, I think like if you're in this industry and you're always buying eclectic stuff, then you probably know those odd people. Like yeah. that, that doesn't stretch my imagination so far that I'm like, okay, you don't know a gold coin guy it's like of course you know a gold coin yeah. guy yeah if you're if you're, this is your hobby you probably do know a coin guy right but this is eventually what i learned about the show that made it unwatchable to me oh gosh is that the way the show actually functions is that they the people who they go to do the appraising are the people those people are donating items from their shops to the show to be put in the lockers no and then the people who bid on them find the object and contact this person they know and then that store gets exposure on the show so like the stuff they find that they take to the people those are all plants and it's like no! they're not i know it's it was like this like wrecked my brain because me and beth probably watched i mean we watched the show so much when it was on Oh my god. In like gosh. full force. And it was it was so like ugh, that's ugh. you're like the the fun of the show is that they're basically opening up a lottery and like either they struck big, they they risked it. They you know, sometimes they get in little bidding wars with each other and you're like, "Oh, when the, ugh, he he forced the guy up to like 3,000. He really it's really important that he find something cool in there." Right, right, right. Yeah. Like the, the stakes are so they're so manageable but also yeah. like very relatable. Right. You know, it's like like you you can it, it's not hard to get invested <laughs> in exactly that concept because it's it's so straightforward yeah it's like here's a place where there might be a rare thing yeah and it because uh, and the fun was you know whatever they find they take it to the appraiser and they'd be like i know what this is this came from this kind of factory in this time period of america and these were hard to find because they were made with this particular thing and it was like oh this is a cool little history lesson about whatever they found right but it's like, yeah, it's not real. Not real people. Ugh. Yeah. And re sorry if you still watch Storage Wars and I just ruined it for you. But, <laughs> but I'm not sorry. Wake up, sheeple. She sheeple. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Okay. Okay. There well, I, I mean, that that was fascinating and I had no idea any of that. That is a super, super interesting insight sorry, into... I know you did completely. Is Pawn Stars the same way? Almost. Almost definitely. Goodness. I, 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 sorry. Sorry. Let me enunciate that. Almost definitely. Not oh, mostly. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Almost definitely. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know for sure that that's the case, but I would uh, totally, totally bet that's how Pawn Stars works. Okay. And how American Pickers works. Yeah. I would bet. I would yeah. bet. I don't... Now, river monsters? Probably not. You can't really plant the fish. Where of? Oh, dude. There would be nothing more upsetting. <laughs> it's like... It's like really what they did. They, they sedated a 400-pound tuna and dropped it in the area. <laughs> like... like no, <laughs> that'd be so terrible. Uh, that was that show was real popular for a hot second. I don't know. I don't know that that's still on. Okay, before we sign off because we're we're right at that limit. So I, I want to ask you the question that are these shows that we're discussing are they reality TV? Hmm. 
Mm. Like, what is the difference between, like, a game show and reality TV and, like, House Hunters? Like, is House Hunters reality TV? Let's see. I think, like, a game show like Jeopardy, not reality TV. Okay. Um, A lot of... But then, like, Survivor, for example. It is a game, but it is, I would say, reality show based around a game. Okay. And typically, my, my... distinction is if they have like the the cutaway confessionals like the talking heads where they're interviewing the people one-on-one outside the game or whatever yep but there are plenty of shows that are game shows that have adopted this just to make the show more engaging like if you watch chopped they're constantly cutting away to To the the floating head to describe what was happening in that moment or whatever but i wouldn't call chopped a reality show i would just call it a game show okay i'm gonna give you the the quick google definition of a reality tv show okay it says television programs in which real people are continuing Continuously filmed, designed to be entertaining rather than informative. Mm, okay. Which I think that distinction is kind of interesting because I think you could make the argument that things like Storage Wars, where they're, they might be teaching you about like an old musket. Yeah. I think that, that that can be informative, maybe. Or does that not count? Is that is, think, is that still entertainment? I think, okay. See, Storage Wars falls into a weird category because actually it's all staged, right? <laughs> okay. Because, so like okay. the deception is that it is informative when actually it's just entertaining because it's all staged okay okay that's it okay. so now i don't i don't know um i would ca- i wouldn't call that reality i wouldn't call i wouldn't call, i would just call that like a i don't even know it's like it's it's like it's not really a game show either it's like a i don't know i wouldn't say reality i'm not giving it reality okay I'm giving that status okay then you have something like kardashians that's through and through reality tv that's reality tv that's reality tv but i think you have to have the same real because the storage wars people like like the people who are bidding, they must be paid by whatever network A&E they're on, A and E or something. Like as people to, to appear on the show. Okay. Whereas, let's see, what would be another like sort of towing the line example? I think I think Chop is probably a good example of not reality but presented in the same format. Sure. Because. You don't have the same real people from episode to episode. That is true. I think you have to have a season-long narrative for it to be like reality TV about the same people in every episode. Could you make the argument that the specific personalities of the people on the show is particularly relevant? Like, Like, what you are watching is is the people and the way that the people are interacting with one another is what makes the show interesting on its whole. I think that's pretty much it. And often the circumstances under which you're being filmed, like if you're talking about Survivor, most of what you're just watching is them interacting with each other, but there's this overwhelming, the game itself is so present that it forces very unusual interactions out of you. It's the facilitator. It's It's the facilitator of uncomfortable and backstabby interaction. It's like a board game, but in real life. Life. Which are also played in real life. Which are also played in real life. <laughs> yeah. So could there be a board game reality TV show? I'm a oh, thousand percent positive you can buy Survivor the board game. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I want to know if there could be a reality TV show where the characters are playing a board game. Oh, totally. totally? Yeah. This is, I mean, to an extent, there's a five bazillion Dungeon and Dragons podcasts and streaming things and stuff like that. A bajillion. Easily. That's that okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. There you go. Okay. Okay. I, I'm I'm fascinated. I want there to be a mainstream, highly produced board game reality TV show. I bet you're gonna hear I bet this exists and there's a single clear example, and you're going to get emails about it nonstop. Bring it on. If you guys have any feedback for us at all, I love reading your emails. You can you can send us an email at popcornculturepod at gmail.com or you can follow us on social media forever variety of different ways on twitter i am at scb underscore ben j is at j-o-n-k-e-r-l-i-n that's at john Kerlin. yep and uh what is our twitter handle at a pop a pop cast at a pop cast yes yeah be sure follow to go and follow us. us or you can just shoot me an email that's just as good because i i do read them um otherwise guys i think that is everything for today until next time pop pop <laughs>